right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. I want to give a shout out to everybody who's joining us either live on camera or live on YouTube on this lovely Friday. Uh, really great to still be able to do these events uh, and continue to broadcast them live into the homes of educators, students, um, and families across North America. So we have a great event in store for today. Today we're hanging out with Yasmin Ali. She is a chemical engineer working in the energy sector. So she fell into chemical engineering by accident, but she's now very passionate about promoting engineering stories and careers to the public and especially uh, young people. So as a writer, she's written about uh, engineering and energy for um, things like the BBC, the Huffington Post and others. And today she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about climate change and some of the really cool innovations uh, that are coming down the pipeline to help tackle it. So Yasmin, it's so great to have you joining us live from the UK today. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better. And of course, we'll fire away with a little Q&A action. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I've got some pictures to show you guys. So hopefully that is working. You can see that? Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm Yasmin Ali. Uh, thank you all for joining. I'm really excited to talk to you today about what I do and some of the stuff that's happening in the energy sector. Uh, so I'm a chemical engineer. Um, I was born in Baghdad in Iraq. Uh, in the Middle East. And I remember when I was a kid, we would have power cuts quite regularly. So every few days we would lose our electricity supply, which was really annoying, as you can imagine. Um, so then I moved to the UK with my family when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And over here, the energy supply is really reliable. It's great. We never have power cuts. And I now work in energy. So part of my job is to make sure that people don't experience these power cuts. So it's all kind of gone full circle, which is great. Um, I am a chemical engineer. That's what I studied at university. And what that means is, so chemical engineering is all about turning raw materials into useful products. So it's not just energy, it's anything that's manufactured. So chemical engineers can work in the manufacture of things like plastics. So you see these bottles here, but also inside those bottles is clean drinking water, which we all need all of the time. Otherwise we would die within about three days of not having clean drinking water. Uh, and all over the world, there are facilities that uh, clean up water. And again, chemical engineers can work in that sector. Um, also in medicines. So if we think about the coronavirus that's happening right now, there are uh, scientists and medical professionals coming up with a vaccine. But once they come up with that vaccine, we're gonna need lots and lots of it. We'll probably need millions of doses of it to give to people. So chemical engineers can help with scaling up that process. Um, another interesting and exciting area is food manufacturing. So I have friends who work in chocolate manufacturing and, you know, because that's again a process uh, and ice cream as well is made in a factory. So as a chemical engineer, you can work in those sectors. Um, but like I said, I work in energy and I really like working in that sector because we're using energy all of the time. So this is a picture that I took a few months ago when I was still allowed outside. Um, and I just picked out the bits that were using energy. Some of them are quite obvious. So my laptop, the lights are on, my phone is there, that lady walking past is on her phone. There was a coffee machine behind me and all of those things are hooked up to an electricity supply. Maybe slightly less obvious maybe is the car and the bus. So they've got um, petrol inside them, which is being burnt and propelling them forward. So that's another type of, um, of energy use. Um, and maybe even less obvious is the asphalt and the concrete uh, in the road and in the sidewalk, um, and also the plastic in the bottle and the glass that's in those windows. These are all materials that have to be manufactured and we need an energy supply to make that happen. And the other one that I've got on there is the, the guy walking past, he's got like a, a synthetic jacket on. And so that's made of some sort of plastic. And again, the same story, 
we need an energy supply to make that happen. Um, so I started working in energy and I started off in a coal fired power station. So this is a, a place that takes coal and we burn that coal and we use the energy that's embedded in that coal to generate electricity. And you can do the same with gas. So you can take uh, natural gas and burn that and generate electricity. And those things, so coal is mined from underground, uh, gas and petrol or oil, as I've mentioned, come from deep underground. So another part of energy is getting those resources out of the ground. So I also worked in uh, oil and gas. Uh, so this picture here is from a platform which is in the middle of the sea, it's in the middle of the North Sea. And we've got equipment on there that allows us to drill deep under the seabed to get to oil and gas that's underground, get it out and put it in, in pipes and send it back to land where it can be used and be quite useful. Um, all of those things that I've mentioned so far, so coal, oil, gas, have a, a problem. When we burn them, we release greenhouse gases uh, like carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that contributes to climate change. So it's not very good for our planet. Um, these gases are disturbing the balance of, of the climate. So we now need to come up with sustainable ways of generating energy. So I left oil and gas and all of that stuff behind and I now work for the government, for the UK government. And my job is to find companies that have ideas and you know, uh, innovations that can uh, give us a cleaner energy supply and I will give them funding, so give them money and also help them to develop their ideas. And um, so it's quite a, quite a fun job. Um, right, so let me, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, as engineers, we solve problems, but in order to solve a problem, we first need to understand it. So we need to understand what's going on, break it down, and then we can start to think about ways to fix it. So with climate change, we know that it's these greenhouse gases that cause it. And we know that these gases come from lots of different places. So what we do is we measure. So we measure the um, emissions that come from cars. We measure emissions coming from factories. We measure emissions coming from electricity supply. And we give all of that data to the climate scientists and they put it into nice pictures for us and it shows us where emissions are coming from and we can then start to think about the solutions. So if we look at the US um, as an example, this is where the greenhouse gas emissions come from by sector. So you can see that more than half of emissions, um, as you can see in this pie chart, come from transport and electricity supply. So already we can think, okay, these are like big areas that we should be working on. And then we've got industry, uh, commercial and residential and agriculture. So I'll say a little bit more about each of them. Um, transport emissions come from cars, uh, buses, anything that's using fossil fuels to drive it forward. So if you get into your car and you're going out to school or somewhere, your car is burning petrol and releasing uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's also releasing a whole bunch of other nasty stuff that's really bad for the air quality. So it's not very nice for us to be breathing in. So if we solve this transport problem, it's like a double win. We, um, it's better for the environment, uh, better for climate, and also it gives us nicer air to breathe in. Um, moving on to electricity, so emissions from generating electricity, we've already seen a bit of that earlier. So because we use coal and gas, we are releasing uh, emissions from the fossil fuels when we do this. Um, industry emissions come from the manufacture of stuff. So if you think about a skyscraper, it's made from lots of steel and concrete and glass. And these are like materials that need quite a lot of energy to be manufactured. Uh, so for example, the steel, once we make it, we need to shape it into the, the right shapes that we need for that building. And it's got a really high melting point. So it's like, I think it's over a thousand degrees that we need to generate to be able to melt steel. 
and that needs a source of energy and use, usually in industry they use fossil fuels to make the energy that they need um, for, for making the stuff that we want. And then if we look at the other kind of smaller segments at the end there, so we had uh, emissions from residential and commercial. Uh, so that's your house, basically your shops. So if it's really cold outside, you're going to have the heating on. Or if it's really hot outside, you'll have air conditioning on. And these things are quite likely to be, um, again, using fossil fuels. And finally, uh, agricultural emissions. So uh, these emissions come mostly from cows and sheep uh, farting and burping. It's not very nice, but that's that's where they come from. Uh, and when these the animals are farting and burping, they're releasing methane. So methane is another greenhouse gas, and it's a really strong greenhouse gas, more so than carbon dioxide. So a small amount of methane will have a really large greenhouse gas effect. So having less cows and sheep around would help with this uh, segment of emissions. So now that we understand the picture of where these emissions come from, we can look at some of the solutions that are out there, uh, starting with transport. So instead of having um, petrol powered cars, we can have electric cars. So instead of going to the filling station and putting some gas into your car, you can charge it up with electricity. Uh, that way there are no emissions when the car is driving along, great for air quality. Um, but with this, we have to remember where that electricity is coming from. If it's coming from a coal fired power station down the road, we're just pushing those emissions down the road. So we haven't really solved the problem. Um, but if we fix our electricity supply at the same time, then we've, we, have, we do solve this. Um, so that takes me to my next point, which is around electricity supply. These are wind farms. You may have seen them around. Uh, they capture the, the energy from the wind and they use that to generate electricity. Uh, this is, these are popping up quite a lot over the UK. These are offshore wind turbines. So these ones are actually attached to the seabed and they are absolutely massive. They're so big. Um, you might be able to tell from the boat that's there, but um, I took this picture back in the summer. Um, that arrow is pointing to I think it was two people who were working on one of the blades. So that shows you how ginormous these things are. And they're getting bigger. The bigger they are, the more energy we can capture from the wind and the more electricity we can generate. And we send that all back down cables, back to land so that we can use it. Um, the, because these are attached to the seabed, it means we can only put them in quite shallow sea. So another fun innovation that's happening right now is um, something called floating offshore wind. So this turbine that you see here is, is floating. It's not attached to the seabed. It's floating on that yellow triangle that you see. And that means that uh, we can use a lot more of the area of the sea to generate renewable electricity, which is fun. Um, the other kind of obvious place where we can capture energy from and turn it into electricity is from the sun. Uh, so you again, you may have seen solar panels around where you live. Um, I really like this. Uh, these are stained glass windows, but they're also solar panels. So not only do you get like a really nice looking window, but it's also creating electricity for you. So you might be able to see at the bottom there, there's a small USB port so you could charge your phone from your window, which is great. Um, and this is another way of generating electricity. So these funny tiles that you see, they are actually capturing the motion from that, the guy who's dancing or jumping around. And they're capturing that kinetic energy and turning it into electricity. So imagine if all of our sidewalks were lined with this, or if we had dance floors that had these tiles on them and we can use all of that energy from people jumping and dancing around to generate electricity. That would be quite good, I think. Um, so all of these things that I've mentioned so far are to do with reducing the amount of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere. Um, another thing that we could be doing is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
And the best way of doing that is by planting trees. Uh, when trees go through the photosynthesis um, thing that they do, they actually uh, absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So it's really important that we protect our forests and also plant trees. Um, but there are things like this out there. So these, this is a technology to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And um, so these fans are sucking air in and separating the carbon dioxide out. And then we can take that and store it underground, or we can use it to make petrol or other products from that carbon dioxide. Um, so that's just a few of the things that are going on. Uh, thank you for listening. And I would love to answer any questions that you have. All right. Yasmin, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us a little bit of the work you do uh, about uh, you know, chemical engineering being in all different things around us that we may not have thought about uh, and sharing with us some really neat solutions that engineers are working on uh, to tackle uh, climate change. Uh, Yasmin, I'll just get you to stop the screen share and come back to us nice and front and center. And then we'll see if we got some questions. I have a feeling uh, that we'll have lots of questions. Uh, oh, it should be up at the top. There should be a, a yeah, stop. I got it. No, okay. <laughs> all right, excellent. Uh, well, I want to give a few shout outs uh, via YouTube. So we have a few groups joining us. We've got Ms. Huxley's class, grade fives in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, we've got Mrs. Wallace joining us from Deseronto Public School. School. Uh, we've got grade seven and eights joining us from Aurelia, Ontario as well. So uh, those who are joining us, let's um, Start putting some questions into the chat sidebar and I'll take some from our live groups as well. But Yasmin, we've got a question already um, from somebody right. on YouTube and they're wondering about uh, nuclear power. Okay. So I know- in general it, or? <laughs> yeah, I think just because they didn't see it in the list. So maybe ah, okay, yeah. your thoughts or your opinion on, on that being an energy source going forward. Yeah, so um, it's I, I personally have mixed views on nuclear power. So it doesn't emit carbon dioxide, which is great, um, but we don't really know what to do with the waste. Having said that, it's like it's quite a small amount of waste, radioactive waste that we get from nuclear power. Um, so it is it's I think the general consensus around how we get our electricity is that we need a mix. Um, so it's probably good to have a little bit of nuclear and some of the other renewables in that mix. And the good thing about nuclear power is that you get a good steady supply of electricity, whereas with wind and solar, it's quite intermittent because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun is not always shining. Okay, awesome. So uh, those who are tuning in, I did open a slider room for this event, uh, which means I've got a little interactive quiz we'll do a little bit later after a few more questions. So. I'm gonna post the link, oops, the link to Slido in the chat sidebar. And the event code for today is chemical. So that should be pretty easy to remember. So we'll see how well uh, people are paying attention to Yasmin today. And we'll see who comes out top uh, in today's quiz. So Yasmin, we'll do that a little bit later. Let's meet That's one good. of our live groups. We've got Zoe hanging out with us in Indiana. Uh, she is ready to go. Zoe, you wanna pop your mic on and go ahead. So I was wondering which countries have the best and the worst carbon footprints? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so let me think. I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but I know that Norway is very good. So they've got lots of hydroelectric power, um, lots of renewables. They're also quite far ahead with um, electric vehicles. I think they have probably the most sales of electric vehicles across the world. Um, so they're, they're pretty great. Um, the worst countries are, I believe, China and the US. Um, and again, that's just because of the amount of transport that goes on and the way that the electricity is generated. Um, but both, I've seen both countries are working towards switching over to renewables. Um, so I think hopefully we will get there eventually. All right, great question, Zoe. Uh, let's go to Keon in New Jersey. He's hanging out with us. You want to turn your mic on for me, Keon? What's the rarest thing people do to 
fix this greenhouse gas problem. What was that? What's the worst thing? What's the rarest pe thing people do to fix the greenhouse gas problem? Okay, so I think you're saying what's the rarest thing? What is maybe yeah. something that people haven't heard about as much? Ah. Um, like some, hmm. I think that the whole kind of, there's a thing called carbon capture and storage, which is, I, I mentioned at the end there, so those fans sucking the carbon out of the atmosphere, um, that is not really talked about too much. I don't think many people know about it. Um, but I have to say that I think that's a last resort. We should be um, reducing our emissions first. And then if we absolutely have to, we should look at capturing carbon from the atmosphere and then storing it. Um, but yeah, that's probably a, a bit of a, an odd one that people maybe don't know so much about. Yeah, and then Yasmin, I know in the UK, um, there's wave motion. So having kind of those big snakes that can move with the waves and generate energy that way. Do you ever, have you ever worked around uh, that kind of energy capture? Um, I've seen a little bit of it. So yeah, there's the wave, there's a lot of stuff you can do in the sea. Um, so the wave, also you can use the, the power of the tides as well. So you can put turbines, which look a bit like the wind turbines that I showed you, but you put those underwater uh, in the sea. And as the tides rise and fall, they drive those turbines. Um, so there are, the, the problem with those is because it's in, in the sea, it's quite a harsh environment. They're, you know, in water all the time, salty, just being like battered with stuff. Um, so you need quite expensive materials, which makes it a bit more challenging. All right. We have another question I'm going to grab off YouTube here. And actually, Yasmin, we talked about this a little bit just before we started. So Gail is wondering about hydrogen. Is hydrogen a potential fuel for the future? It is. That's actually exactly what I work on. <laughs> Um, yeah, so hydrogen is a, a very abundant element uh, in, in the world, but it's um, always attached to other molecules. So water is made of um, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, there's also hydrogen in fossil fuels. So fossil fuels are usually carbon and hydrogen um, sort of attached together. Um, but the good thing, if, you, if you're able to separate the hydrogen out, you can burn it as a fuel. And when it goes through that chemical reaction, um, the, what you get at the other end is just water um, and oxygen. So you don't get that carbon dioxide. So it's potentially a good energy carrier, we call it. So it's a way of kind of um, trans, well, it's a way of um, kind of using energy without uh, releasing carbon dioxide. Um, so you can manufacture or make it in a couple of different ways. You can do electrolysis, which some of you may have done at school, where you're passing an electric current through um, water and separating that into hydrogen and oxygen. And if you get your electrolysis machine and you attach that to a wind turbine, then you've got a, a green system there. So you, you've got no emissions, which is great. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that is uh, gaining more uh, notice. All right. So some of our students might be too young, but I definitely remember that experiment in high school where you do the little electrolysis with the test tubes and then with the hydrogen one, you take the little burning splint and you get the little pop. Pretty yeah. cool experiment. Very They've cool. got that to look forward to. All right. Uh, Amy and Isabel are hanging out with us in Indiana. Let me turn their mic on. All right. I was wondering, you said like one of your favorite parts of your job is you get to go around and look for people who have ideas on how to stop climate change. Uh, are you using anything right now that people have already come up with? Uh, yeah, so actually a lot of the ideas that we support are not new things. So they're things that already exist and maybe they someone has come up with a way of making them um, a bit less expensive or they've made like a slight improvement that makes it a little bit better. I, there's not really like many brand new ideas out there, um, but it's, it's more about like 
making the existing ideas better. Um, so things like energy storage, batteries, we do a lot of work on that, uh, making you know better batteries that can store more electricity for longer, that kind of thing. Very cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Great question. Um, let's see. So we'll go to another one from YouTube. And so this is from um, this is Huxley, whose fifth graders are tuning in. And she's wondering, uh, actually, there's a few questions about carbon capture. So we might talk about it for a second. But she's wondering, is there something that that captured carbon can be used for after it's captured? Yeah. So if, like I said earlier, um, if you think about oil, it's made of chains of carbon and hydrogen. So if we take that captured carbon, we can actually um, add some hydrogen to it and we can make synthetic oil. So that's one idea. Um, you just have to be quite careful with where the energy that you're using to do that whole process is coming from. Otherwise, you're kind of using up more energy to make an oil, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's one thing um, you can use the uh, carbon dioxide in the food industry. Um, they sometimes will take it and put it into drinks, but I, I don't think that's really carbon capture because um, that gets released again once you open the bottle and you let the carbon dioxide out again. All right. Uh, another call out. Uh, I can see some groups have already joined into the slider room for the quiz. It's posted in the YouTube chat sidebar on the right. We'll probably do another question or two and then we'll see how well uh, everyone was paying attention today. We'll see who comes out on top. But I know that Keon has another question. So I'm going to get Keon to turn his mic on and go ahead, Keon. What, the, what are the most used elements for fuel? fuel? The most used elements for fuel? That's a good question. Um, I would say it's probably the carbon based fuels. So the fossil fuels like coal, oil, gas, um, they are all made up of carbon with other stuff attached to that carbon. So carbon, hydrogen, and then some other elements attached, but it's, it's all quite carbon based. All right. Um, let's see here. Let's take one more and then we'll jump into the quiz live. So we've got a, a question here from Josh and Josh is wondering if you weren't working in the energy sector, what kind of work do you think you would be doing? So if you weren't a chemical engineer, what do you think you'd be doing? Or is there something you thought about doing younger while you were growing up? Um, oh, I, I don't remember what I wanted to do when I was younger. I think I never really knew. So it was nice to fall into a job that's quite fun. Um, if I wasn't an energy, there are lots of things that I'm really interested in within the chemical engineering um, sector. So I think um, like it's going to sound really bad, but waste and what happens with all of the rubbish that we generate and how it gets processed. I think that's really interesting. Um, but also um, I think the food sector would be quite fun. So I don't, you can't really argue with a, a job in a chocolate factory. That would be pretty amazing. Um, and also like medicines, because my family um, are all are doctors. So I thought about being a doctor, but it's not really for me. Um, but maybe working in that medical space and um, scaling up medicines to help save lives, that would be quite good as well. All right, very cool. Let's take a couple minutes and I'm gonna start the Slido quiz. Um, each question will have 20 seconds. The quicker you answer the question, the more points you'll get. So let's see who comes out uh, on top and then we'll come back because I know Amy and Zoe have their hands up uh, for more live questions. So let's start up that Slido quiz. All right, the first question is up. Oops. I said good luck. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I went too fast. I jumped over the first question. Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. Um, oh, darn. It won't let me read. Let me see if I can restart. I don't know. It kind of just jumped over the question. There we go. I'm resetting it. We're going to try and start again. So everybody's got to join the quiz again. Oh, they, they're joining. So I'll give another couple seconds for everyone to rejoin. I don't know what happened. It just jumped right over uh, the start to the quiz. 
Um, maybe while we wait, because I see there's a few more people who still need to jump back in. Let's do one more question and let's let Zoe turn her mic on. Go ahead, Zoe. So I was wondering for people who already have cars and like can't afford to buy an electric one or use solar panels, what are some of the easier things you can do to reduce your carbon footprint? Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you already have a car, I would say you don't need to buy a new one. The best thing you can do for the climate is use the stuff that you already have. With with transport, it's if you can reduce the amount that you use the car, that would be really good. Um, other things you can do is just like buying less stuff. So for example, if we think about fashion or a lot of the clothes that we wear are made of um, text that like synthetic materials that come from oil i know you don't really expect that but a lot of them started life as oil so if we use the clothes that we have more and don't buy as much stuff um eating less meat as well would be helpful if everybody ate less um not necessarily stopped eating meat altogether but if we eat less meat then there would be less uh, cows and sheep and that would help towards that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So on the on the clothes issue, we talked to a, a scientist out of the UK recently. Uh, her name was Imogen and she talked to us about the fibers off your clothes. So what she's working on is devices that could potentially capture the fibers uh, from your clothes after the washing machine. So hundreds of thousands of tiny little plastic fibers get washed down the drain, into the river, out into the ocean, uh, and we're just now starting to realize the effect that these tiny microplastics can have um, every time we wash our clothes. So, all right, let's get that quiz into high gear. I'm not going to double hit this time when we start and hopefully we can get through it this time. So here we go. First question is coming up. Um, what do we release when we burn coal, oil, and gas. So to yeah, and say ice crystals, pollen, greenhouse gases, or nothing at all. Let's see how we do. We've got a few more seconds. All right. That was an easy one to get you started. Everybody went with greenhouse gases. I'm glad nobody went with pollen. Okay. Let's go to the next question. So this one, uh, is transport accounts for the emission of what percentage of greenhouse gases in the US? Was it 10%, was it 28%, was it 12% or was it 50%? Got 10 seconds left on the clock. All right. I thought for sure we would have tricked a few on that one, but 86% went 28%, so good job paying attention. Let's go to the next question here. The largest amount of methane released in agriculture is from, was it tractors, plants growing, cows burping and farting, or bringing crops to the market? Got 10 more seconds. All right, 88% went with cows burping and farting. Good job. And let's do our last question here. What wasn't a way, Yasmin said, we can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Was it planting more trees? Was it catching it in big bags? Was it sucking it from the air? Or was it protecting our forests? Which did she not talk about? All right, 63% went with catching it in big bags. We definitely did not talk about that. Let's see who came out on top on the leaderboard. Isabella, four to four, 24 seconds. Zoe, four to four, 12 and 25 seconds. And Brayden, four to four in 27 seconds. Good job, everybody. All right, thanks for playing along. Let's grab a few more questions. Uh, Amy, Amy and Isabella, go ahead and turn your microphone on. So uh, you were talking about water turbines, and I was wondering if the cost was the same to run both water and wind turbines, what would be more efficient for the environment? 
Oh, if it was more, if, if it was the same cost. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, that is a good question <laughs> that I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. I'm trying <laughs> to think it would depend on um, if I guess we'd have to think about the size of the turbine and how much uh, energy you could capture with that size. Um, if it was above ground or in the water. Um, hmm. Have to think about that one. Maybe, um, yeah, my, my gut feel is that it would be the wind turbine that's above the sea. Um, just because it's such a challenging environment in the underwater. And I think they look nice as well. So I'd like to be able to yeah. see them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Great question. And I was thinking about that too. You, you showed the wind turbines that were embedded in the seabed. And then you talked about the ones uh, that could kind of float. And I looked at the picture of the floating one. And it looked like there was a lot of infrastructure that goes along with it, but it must be you know, still cost effective because they can pretty much collect air nonstop or collect wind nonstop. So um, even though it looked like a lot of structure, it must still uh, produce enough, enough energy that it's worth it. Yeah, so we don't actually have those in full operation yet. So they're quite new. Um, and the, the problem that we're trying to solve is um, it's actually the cable that takes the electricity back from that wind turbine back to land, you have to have a really long cable, which is quite expensive. And also the cable is going to be kind of flopping around in the sea. So it's, it's quite, you need some really strong materials to be able to, um, to make that happen. All right, excellent. So uh, this is someone asking a question uh, previously from uh, the nuclear power question. Uh, and they're wondering what are a couple of the negative effects uh, that nuclear can have on the surrounding environment, nuclear energy? Yeah, I mean, the, the big one is the un very unlikely event of having a nuclear reactor meltdown, um, which is absolutely catastrophic. So we saw that in um, most recently Fukushima in Japan, and then there was Chernobyl back in 1986, I think. So that is the absolute worst. Um, I think aside from that, they don't really have that much impact. If, if you've got a nuclear power station and it's just sitting there doing its thing, it doesn't really have too much impact on the surrounding environment, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So I think we can probably squeeze in two more questions. So I'm going to take one more from our on camera crew. And then if we get one more on YouTube, I'll work that one in as well. But let's start with uh, Zoe. Go ahead, Zoe. You can turn your mic on one more time. Sorry, I, I uh, forgot to lower my hand. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> no problem, Zoe. Let's uh, grab one more from the YouTube, uh, sorry, the YouTube crew who we have joining us today. And this one is going back to the carbon capture. And Gail's just wondering if you can kind of uh, go into a little more detail about that. Um, what might a potential system look like or maybe one that's working already? Yeah, um, so you would have a, you would, you would need a material that the carbon dioxide would stick to. So um, we use uh, things called amines. Uh, so you'd have like uh, a tower with this amine in and then you would um, suck the air in uh, over like through that tower and because you've got this amine in there um, the carbon dioxide would pretty much stick to it and the rest of the air would just flow through and then you take that liquid amine which now has carbon dioxide in it and if you heat that up you can release the carbon dioxide but then you could do that in a place so you could kind of release it where you want to and then capture that CO2 and take it away, put it underground, turn it into other stuff. So that, that kind of thing. All right. And I think a great question to end off on today, Yasmin, is uh, for any potential students out there who might be thinking about engineering as a career, do you have any advice for them? 
Um, yeah, so I would say I would definitely encourage them to think about it and keep looking into it. Um, it's a really rewarding career um, if you want to make a difference in the world and if you want to kind of do something that's good. I think engineering is great and it's really fun as well. I really enjoy it. Uh, so you could, I would say, stick with science and maths. That's quite helpful uh, if you want to be an engineer, um, but also just being curious and thinking about how the things around you work is a, is a really good attribute to have as well if you want to be an engineer. All right. I love it. Excellent. Well, first of all, a huge shout out to the groups who joined us on YouTube today. Thanks for joining in and sending us in some great questions. Obviously, a huge shout out to our groups, our families who join us on camera today. Thanks for hanging out with us. And then Yasmin, thank you so much for taking, letting us take a little time from your day uh, and to hang out with us virtually. Thank you for having me and thank you for the, the tough questions as well. <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, uh, today's a quiet day on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We have one more event at 1 p.m. Eastern, and I'm going to host that one. It's about a deep sea expedition I was on uh, off the coast of California. So we're going to talk about the robots and we were using to explore three kilometers down and all the cool sea creatures we found. So definitely tune in and check that one out at one o'clock Eastern. Thanks again, everyone, for hanging out with us today. Yasmin, thank you so much. And I hope everybody has an awesome weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>